All right, so here's another episode of PT Meal Physical Therapy Podcast, your weekly serving of insights, information, and inspiration from the experience and expertise of Filipino physical therapists. I am Johan de La Paz, your host. Uh, welcome to the show. So before I introduce uh, my guest for today and what we're going to talk about, let me welcome another first for this podcast, my buddies from the East Coast, who will co-host uh, this episode with me from Massachusetts, Levin Abdon, and from Maryland, uh, Mike Kisano, physical therapist. Welcome to the show, Levin and Mike. Thank you for being here. Hello, glad to be here. Hello, <laughs> happy to be of service. <laughs> and uh, so, so I asked them uh, to host this episode today because they know more about the topic than than the, than I do, and 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 appreciate uh, that they will be able to like help me talk about uh, the topic with our, our guest today. And uh, for today's episode, we are going to talk about what it's like being a physical therapist for an NFL uh, team. What's uh, the PT's responsibilities? How does he take care of the team, the athletes? So we'll, we'll talk all about that later. And uh, for our guest today is a physical therapist for the LA Rams, John Hernandez, doctor of physical therapy. John, welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me, Johan. I appreciate it. Happy to I, be on. Yeah, so it my, uh, it's our pleasure uh, to have you here. And uh, as I've mentioned earlier, I was like, when I, when I learned that you're, you're uh, Filipino after hearing a, a podcast, um, I was really excited and wanted to, to have you in the show so that we can also like uh, share with other Filipino physical therapists that, that at least we have like a, a, have a role model in, uh, <laughs> in the NFL. Because, you know, like, I think it's that that's important to have someone like like you, you know, someone like you in, in that field so that you can like aspire to be that person. So yeah, so we're really truly glad that that you're you're here on um, the podcast. So so before we dive into the topic, I usually ask my uh, guests how they they started their physical therapy journey. So what's your physical therapy story? How did you become a physical therapist and and, and what led you to that path? Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a story. Mm -hmm. So I know we have a little bit of time. So I'll kind of take you down the path a little bit. Yeah. Um, so when I was in high school, I was a junior in high school, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. So my, my dad, he worked for the State Department. And he took me with him when he was stationed there for about two to three years. And he had me volunteer at a rehab clinic. And it was a clinic that dealt with kids and adults that were landmine victims in Cambodia. So you know, for that, that was my first exposure to, you know, individuals who were, you know, affected by or functionally affected by, you know, missing limbs and having to use a prosthesis and having to walk again and learn how to use their hands again using an assistive device. So for that, you know, I saw a lot of success stories. So on the board, they had these success stories that took about nine months, 12 months, and, you know, where they were being bedridden, missing limbs, and then where they were at nine, 12 months later, where they were walking again, playing basketball again, and, you know, playing sports. I was like, man, this is amazing. Like, that is an, an amazing thing to me. And I think that's what really got me hooked into physical therapy. Mm -hmm. That's when I really honed in on wanting to do physical therapy and pursue physical therapy. So when I was deciding on colleges, I kind of wanted to take a non-traditional route, or I guess it was somewhat traditional route, but you know, I could have taken kinesiology, exercise science, or athletic training. Mm -hmm. And I decided to take athletic training because it provided the opportunity to do more hands-on work. So while I was going to class, I was also helping work sports of the school. I went to University of Delaware, so, you know, cl close to Maryland on the East Coast. Uh -huh. So hey, hey. I went mm -hmm. to University of Delaware for that. Did athletic training undergrad, but while I was doing my undergrad, I was getting the requirements and prerequisites for physical therapy school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, athletic training was really got me into sports. You know, growing up, I was really big into basketball. That was kind of like my big thing. You know, I feel like that's a kind of big Filipino thing, Filipino right. culture. You know, basketball mm -hmm. so Very Filipino in the country, yeah. and I think that really translated to you know when I came here, or when I was just you know being around it with my parents and my relatives. You know, basketball was kind of like my first love. So I went to University of Delaware, I got exposed to football, and that's when I really got to learn about a different sport. I had not, nothing 
I had no knowledge about it. I knew mm -hmm. nothing about it. I didn't know how to play it. I didn't know the positions. I didn't know anything about it. But being able to work the sport allowed me the opportunity to learn more about it mm -hmm. and realize, you know, you know, physical therapy has such a big and, and rehab and athletic training has such a big impact on that sport specifically because there's so many people in the sport and there's so many nuances of the sport. There's prehab, there's rehab, there's covering the game, there's taping and bracing, all that stuff. So it was very all encompassing. So I really gravitated towards that. So, you know, as I finished up, you know, I wanted to do physical therapy. I did athletic training. Um, so when it came time to figuring out where I wanted to go to PT school, I ended up getting to USC and I, you know, went to USC for PT school. And while I was there, I really didn't want to lose my athletic training, you know, background. So when I was at USC, I, you know, tried to stay involved in athletic training and sports, worked with uh, club sports and rec sports at USC. And that's how I kind of stayed involved while I learned about all the other parts of physical therapy, right? So mm -hmm. pediatric, geriatric, neurological, all the other things I was learning PT school, but I was also kind of getting, you know, a little bit of extra sports, you mm -hmm. know, while I was there. Um, and Nicole, let me backtrack. So also with the, N the NFL connection, right? So when I was actually at University of Delaware, there was an upperclassman that did a uh, summer internship with the Buffalo Bills. So when they came and played the Philadelphia Eagles, that upperclassman asked me to help work the game with him, with the Buffalo Bills staff. Mm -hmm. When I went, you know, it was awesome. You know, first NFL game on the sideline, um, I was handing out water. It was very, you know, a small task, but, you know, I thought it was awesome, right? I was handing out water. I was getting yelled at by Eagles fans. <laughs> They're freaking, you know, giving me a hard time. I'm like, man, what the heck? This is the NFL. <laughs> That's crazy. So I, I built a connection with the Buffalo Bills staff, you know, and they asked me, hey, you know, if you want to do summer internship, get in contact with us. So when I sent them my resume and cover letter, you know, I was a procrastinator. I was a little bit of a slacker. Uh -huh. They had already filled all the summer positions when I applied. Mm -hmm. So luckily, Sean Gibson, the assistant athletic trainer at the time, referred me to one of his buddies, Reggie Scott, who is an assistant athletic trainer for the Carolina Panthers. So I ended up doing a summer internship with the Carolina Panthers in 2008. Mm -hmm. That's pre-PT? Pre athletic training. I, I was athletic, athletic training. training. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so that kind of got my foot in the door in the NFL. Mm -hmm. So when I went to physical therapy school, or when I got into physical therapy school, he, Sean Gibson, the assistant athletic trainer for the Buffalo Bills, actually reached out to me and asked if I want to do a season-long internship. So hold off on PT school, or and do a summer in, or do a season-long internship, or go to PT school. Oh. So it, was, it was like that. That was kind of a big decision for me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do I start the NFL, do an internship, or do I go to PT school? And you know, Sean actually talked me into going to PT school. He was the one trying to get me to do a summer inter or a seasonal internship, and he convinced me to go to PT school. He said that those opportunities don't come along very often, you know, getting to PT school and being able to do that. So try and do that as soon as you can and then, you know, stay in contact with him. Right. So now I was at PT school at USC. I was doing athletic training stuff. I had come in contact with, you know, my buddy Sean. And then when it was time for me to graduate, again, you know, another crossroads, right? I was in contact with Sean. He asked me, hey, do you want to do a seasonal internship? But I actually got to the sports residency at USC. So I'm oh, like, okay. <laughs> sports residency was a kind of a big deal. Right, right. Me, at least at the time, because I would have the opportunity to work at USC, work with, you know, their program, work with football, work with all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, I turned Sean down again. I said, you know, I really want to do this, the, this sports residency. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do a sports residency and that really afforded me the opportunity to combine athletic training and physical therapy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with residencies, and I'm sure all you guys know as well, you know, that kind of gives you specific, you know, skills and knowledge of a certain, you know, discipline of physical therapy. Mm -hmm. So for me, having an athletic training background and learning about sports and learning how it's applied in physical therapy in a sports setting, you know, that for me was a big turning point in my thought process of learning how to utilize both and be not one or the other, but more of a sports medicine clinician right. um, and rehab clinician. So I think that was really helpful. So then when my residency was over, again, at Crossroads, didn't know where I wanted to go to, you know, work, didn't know where I wanted to go to work. 
Um, I was convinced I was going to stay in Southern California, live by the beach, you know, work at an ortho clinic. But, you know, I kept in, in contact with my buddy, Sean. And he said, hey, you know, I don't have a seasonal position open for you. I actually have a full-time position that's open. Do you want to interview? So, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I want to move to Buffalo. You know, I'm in Southern California. I've been here for four years. Mm -hmm. but you know what? You know, this is an opportunity that doesn't come along very often. So I want to give it its due diligence. Went over there, interviewed. It was an amazing interview process. The staff was awesome. The you know front office was awesome, and you just kind of get that vibe, that very home, homey vibe. It was very welcoming. It it just felt comfortable. So I ended up taking the position with the Buffalo Bills. That was my first full time position as a PT. I was there for two years, mm -hmm. and um, when I found out the Rams were moving to LA, I thought, man, like that's a perfect opportunity, right? Like. So that's me, you know, being able to work in the NFL, but working back in LA, you uh -huh. know, which was, you know, no team in LA. I went to USC, you know, I wanted to stay in LA. Like, oh man, what an opportunity. So, you know, I, I applied and crazy enough, the head athletic trainer for the LA Rams was actually Reggie Scott, who was my boss with the Carolina Panthers in 2008. Wow. So he was in 2008 in Carolina, he became the head athletic trainer for the St. Louis Rams. And when they moved to LA, we had that small connection from my summer internship. You know, and I like to say, you know, that this, this the story comes full circle. I like to say that my experience in Carolina helped, you know, maybe right. put me together some some people, you know, when I interviewed for the Rams position. So that's, you know, that's how I ended up, you know, with the Rams. Mm, nice. So, so all your, your career moves were all leading to sports. To to for from a type trainer to is that really what you wanted when you went into physical therapy school that you're gonna go concentrate on sports? You know, I was pretty, I was pretty honed in. I will mm -hmm. say that. You know, I mm -hmm. kept my, I kept my options open when I was doing my different rotations. You know, pediatrics and geriatrics and acute care and all that stuff. Um, but I kept on going back to sports. You know, I, you know, I like to tell young clinicians don't close the door on certain disciplines because mm -hmm. you. No, mm -hmm. I had a buddy who went to school with me. He was an athletic trainer. He was into sports, super into mm -hmm. sports. Just more, more than me. He more knew about. He knew more about football than me. Wanted to do sports, all that stuff. He had one pediatric rotation. It is now a pediatric physical therapist um, in Orange County. Mm -hmm. And you know, for him, it was just that one experience, that one clinical rotation that changed, you know, his trajectory of what he wanted to pursue. So I like to tell people, you have to keep your options open. Don't just think like sports, where sports. Like, yes, it's in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. but you have to be able to have an open mind with all the other opportunities that present to you during PT mm -hmm. school. Right, right. So you don't, you, don't, uh, you don't just focus on one thing, but you, you, you forget to see the other opportunities around you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say this also too, like some of the skills that I learned, you know, in those different rotations I still use today, mm -hmm. you know, the transfer and being able to gate train when mm -hmm. dealing with um, patients who you know, had stroke, you know, mm -hmm. that's important for people who are athletes that can't walk and are non weight bearing and need to transfer in and out of bed and teaching them certain skills or learn like teaching them how to walk. Like, you know, they haven't been able to use a, a limb for say eight weeks to 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, there could be a similar timeline for someone who, you know, uh, experienced a stroke. Mm -hmm. So they ha have similar functional limitations that you have to be able to, again, you know, reteach them to be able to use. And I think yeah. that's universal. It's not so much one or the other. You know, mm -hmm. function is universal. Right, right. And uh, so we, you, you mentioned earlier that you were an athletic trainer uh, uh, background and went to physical therapy school. So for those who are not familiar, like me, who's uh, not familiar with uh, athletic tra training and athletic as a training athletic trainer so what's an athletic trainer uh how is it different from from physical uh therapy is so an athletic what? trainer deals more with you know you're directly in sports right mm -hmm. so you're right. in the athletic training room and you deal with a lot more in terms of the spectrum of a, a sports injury or sports mm -hmm. so physical therapy has more to do about rehab but then athletic trainer has a lot to do with like acute care management and prehab so mm -hmm. taping and bracing is a preventative measure Mm -hmm. um, you care. So something happens on the field at the time, 
you are the first person on the scene taking care of that injury of that player, knowing, you know, do I have to call 911? Do I have to, or how do I splint him? How do I get him off the field? You know, what are the things I need to do to package them to get them to the next medical professional to take care of them? Mm -hmm. um, you know, they also have background in, in rehab as well. Right. So I like to think that, you know, athletic trainers do kind of like the whole spectrum of, you know, athletic medicine or sports medicine care. Mm -hmm. PTs have the rehab expertise. Mm -hmm. So you add that into, you know, that because with an athletic trainer, they have a rehab background, but they're so focused on other things as well. You know, rehab is a focus, but not as much of a focus as it is for a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. That makes right. sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's, you know, a, a, a distinguishing factor, but there is a lot of gray area. There is a lot of overlap. Right. And you know, I get that question all the time, but I really do think that one of the biggest things that is a difference. It's kind of like the acute care management. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. sure. so more and more acute for, for an athletic trainer. Right so. on the field or, you know, injury happens right in front of you. What is that first 24, 48, 72 hours like? Because, mm -hmm. you know, when if a patient comes to a physical therapy clinic, they could be two weeks out. They could be three weeks out, a week mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. uh, of an injury. But, you know, surgery could be within a week. So it's all different, but... I will say there's a lot of gray area. Mm -hmm. I think that that gap is starting to close a little bit because physical therapists are starting to learn more about acute care and athletic training, like, you know, with the sports residency. Mm -hmm. And athletic trainers are learning a lot more about physical therapy and rehab. So I feel like, you know, they were here, you know, years ago, but I think they're starting to mesh a lot more and there's a lot more overlap these days. Right, right. Okay. So, um, Mike, you want to ask something? Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Um, so I was also sports physical therapist before I went to, to the state. So usually there are days where it's really just different, but how for athletes, I mean that, but um, knowing that the NFL is like a high impact sport, all speed, all power, and there's like different positions that you gotta also watch out. Like center is gonna be different with the skills of a running back or wide receiver is gonna be different from a quarterback's injury. So. Can you describe to us, like, how do you prepare for a typical day in an NFL, especially game day? Yeah. So with the different positions, that's yeah. something I had to learn, you know, on the fly and just watching, watching football, watching practice, and just also having conversations with the players and being, you know, having the humility to say, hey, I don't know anything about your position. Teach me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, th I think that's something that I was holding on to, like, oh, man, I need to do research and, you know, learn about this position, learn the vocabulary. But at a certain point, I was just, why don't I just ask them? You know, I'm not a center. You know, I shouldn't <laughs> have to know that stuff. I should yeah. just ask the expert. I should ask the person, like, what do you do? And then, you know, I, I think as movement performance specialists or movement analyst specialists, I, I like to consider physical therapists now. Mm -hmm. If you just give someone a movement, I feel like as physical therapists, we can do a good job of breaking that down. So it's like, what's your end goal? And then how do you dissect that into, you know, little pieces to be able to build back up? You know, I think that's a good general framework to think about when, you know, it is a sport that you don't know a lot about. And when I was at USC, I worked with lacrosse and baseball and, you know, all these other sports I really didn't know anything about. So I'd watch the sport. I would have these hypotheses in my head and then I just ask the athlete, all right, is this right? You know, how do you want to move for this? Um, what is the desired movement pattern? Take that, break it down, and then kind of, you know, think of ways to build it back up and find ways to, you know, bring that, that movement to a more efficient uh, pattern, I guess you can say. And then from there, you know, also talking to coaches and also talking to my coworkers. My coworkers have a lot of years of experience working with different positions and with football. So I think for me, being able to, you know, pick their brain about how to rehab a center versus a, a running back, mm -hmm. I think was really important for my development is, you know, just speaking to my peers and dissecting them and, you know, learning from them, I think was really big um, for me. Um, so in terms of the day-to-day, -day, it really depends on the time of the season, right? Mm -hmm. so right now we're pretty set in our, our schedule when it comes to having a Sunday game versus a Monday game. And actually our, our schedule is kind of crazy right now. We have the Thursday game. You know, we had a Monday game like a few weeks ago. Yeah, you know, and, yeah, you won. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it was nice. <laughs> Handily. And I got a mini bye week from it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, it really just depends. You know, generally, you know, if you think about a Monday through Friday schedule, Monday is taking case like a triage day. So you're taking care of athletes that might have gotten hurt on Sunday. Then mm-hmm. Tuesday is normally our day off. So players will come into rehab and then lift. But for the most part, you know, they have the day off. Wednesday is when they start ramping back up. So that's when we'll have practices and then lifts um, for that. Thursday is another practice day. Friday is more of like a f- tempo practice. So it's more of a, you know, a fast Friday, we like to call it. So uh, a shorter practice, but it's fast. And then Saturday is more of a walkthrough and then Sunday is game day. And then in regards to, you know, some of the roles that I have. So in regards to say a typical day, say Wednesday, Wednesday, like, you know, probably the most packed day in regards to what we do, you know, players will come in the morning. First thing, first thing on the schedule is rehab and treatment. So taking care of guys that are potentially going to make it to Sunday and then they go lift. And then when they lift, you know, offense lifts and then the defense meets and then they flip flop. And then during that time when they lift, that's when we start to, or like to add auxiliary work. So supplemental exercises, you know, maybe some prehab exercises, some things for guys who are, you know, dealing with ongoing conditions. You can kind of supplement the, the weight training with or modify the weight training if they need to. And that's something that's, you know, a big piece is being able to work with the strength staff and having that good relationship with them. I think it's really important, not just siloing the two. You know, we are a performance team, not just one or the other medical and strength. You know, I think, mm-hmm you to provide the best care, you have to have a, a good marriage of both. So that's an important relationship that's been awesome for us. You know, our, our, our um, strength coaches are awesome and they're, you know, they, you know, are, I'm always learning from them. And then, you know, we reciprocate with that as well. So again, you know, some of that gray area of, you know, athletic training, physical therapists and strength coaches and physical therapists, a lot of that, a lot of those lines are getting, you know, meshed a little bit. And mm-hmm. so I think, I think that the more you know about the other, the better, the more vocab you can learn about strength conditioning, the more vocab you can learn about athletic training, all these other things, I think help afford you the ability to have conversations with them. And I think that helps break down barriers when it comes to, you know, you know, if it's one or the other, I think is if you guys can have conversations together, I think that's real important for, you know, just that performance um, team. Anyway. All right, I digress. So, you know, they lift and then they go back to meetings. And during when the whole team goes to meetings, that's when guys from uh, the injured reserve IR come in, then we'll rehab them. So they're not on the team schedule. You know, they're out, say they're out for the season. They'll come in. They're more long-term rehabs. And that's kind of, you know, where the physical therapy kind of comes into play. But also athletic trainers too, they'll also have long-term rehabs as well. But that's usually when uh, myself and Byron, Byron Cunningham is the director of rehab for us. You know, that's, you know, the kind of the baby that we take care of is the IR, you know, players. Um, Mm -hmm. So it depends on the season, how busy that may be. But that's usually the time frame we'll take care of them. And then when players get out of meetings, they start to prep for practice. So, you know, during prep or practice, they're doing some prehab exercises. They're getting taped. They're getting braced. They're doing prep work as well to get them ready for practice. Mm-hmm. during practice usually there's coverage so you're just always out there just to make sure everything goes smoothly mm-hmm. but if something does happen you're there to react and also there to attend to them as well and then you know no, normally for me my role is if a player say isn't practicing you know, I'll stay in and continue to work with them and get another rehab session in so you know we're get, kind of trying to get as many rehab sessions as we can if a player say is not practicing, but could make it to Sunday, or maybe not practicing and not going to make it on Sunday, but then can make it to the next week. We want to mm-hmm. try and maximize the treatment, and the rehab they can get. So then from there, you know, they come in after practice and they do post-practice treatment. So, you know, guys who maybe be dealing with some ongoing things, they can kind of get some ongoing treatment, even if they practice. And then, you know, that's the day. And if you think about it, that's like three treatments a day mm-hmm. for guys who are, you know, dealing with an injury. So I think that's, you know, something we try and maximize as much as we can um, in a day. How many times can we can we make sure we get some sort of treatment in? And it, each treatment has, you know, intention. So it's not just, oh, we're just going to do it just to do it. It's like, you know, in the morning, you kind of do your prep and your warm up. And then in the middle of the day, it's more rehab exercises. And on Tuesday uh, at night or after practice, that's more, you know, treatment recovery type stuff. 
So again, there's identities to different parts of, of the treatment and the rehab. We have to make sure we communicate with that with them and then also make sure that we uh, map that out for them as well. Gotcha. All right. Yep. That's a long day, actually. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One day you got to do three rehabs. Oh, my. No, yeah, day. but, uh, you know, when you love it and you're having fun, those yeah. days. Yeah, it's uh, also good that you described the, the whole week of what you do as a physical therapist, because what I imagine a, a, a sports physical therapist do is just like wait for the game day to, to and, and <laughs> see the game. Be injured. So <laughs> it's, it's nice hearing those that, that you have like a good schedule for the whole team and you're really collaborating with the, the performance team with the medical staff and the strength staff to really uh, uh, help the, the athletes reach their, their peak in their um, uh, performance. Yeah. I mean, there's so much that goes into it. You know, I think one big thing now is, you know, recovery and making sure that we can get guys turned over for say, perfect example. We had a Sunday game and we had a Thursday game. We had three days of prep uh, for that game. So how do we maximize that? But, you know, we can't do it alone. So, you know, for us to have the relationship we have with our strength staff, for them being able to execute recovery type strategies and us kind of reinforcing that or being able to help them with the recovery strategies as well. You know, we can touch a lot of players, you know, I think of our, of our roster, you know, 53 man rosters, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that roster the announcement in the 55 and then you have to think practice squad. So you think that's close to 75, something like that. You know, that's you know, 75 people say on our staff together with our interns. I think we have like nine or 10, you know, that's a one to seven ratio. So if everyone's bought in and everyone can kind of help out with that, you know, that ratio ain't bad. That's better than, you know, three or four people are, you know, really executing this. And, you know, that ratio is one to 25, you know, that's got a lot harder. To execute. <laughs> oh my, right. People, you know, delivering the same message. I think that's helpful as well. And I think that's how you reach the masses. And I think that's one thing that's, you know, pretty, all, you know, a big determining factor as well as, you know, with physical therapy, working in a clinic, you have the one-on-one -on -one time, but mm -hmm. then with this, there's a, there's a, there's a bigger group and you may be dealing with like four people at a time. So, you know, I think that's one thing that I had to learn as well as being able to manage my time, prioritize certain things and kind of be better with, you know, managing that as well. Gotcha. All right. Um, my next question is actually related to that and knowing that still NFL is still one of the hardest hitting sports. So recently there's been a, like a lot of discussion about CTE and, you know, brain injury and stuff, but it's been highlighted mostly to football. And can you describe to us like how different the, the procedure is for, uh, you know, athletes that get hit that bad or get concussed in the field and what are your protocols for? Uh, is it standardized by, the, by the, the league or do you have your own protocols to do it? No, so, the, so the, the NFL has a standardized protocol and, you know, it's amazing because it's all encompassing. I mean, I think it's very direct and it's very specific so that there's you know, no gray area. It's either this or that. And I think that's what you need for something like a head injury because that is such a serious, you know, injury. So I think the more black and white you can have, it allows for less like, oh, well maybe, you know, he can kind of slip through the cracks or maybe he can like return back earlier than this person and that person is like, no, do you have symptoms? If you don't have symptoms, then you know, go to the next step. Um, so what happens on game day, say someone sustains a head injury, you know, some, if it's very apparent, you know, we'll go out there and we'll, you know, make sure that he is stabilized and making sure that he's okay. And then what will happen is we'll go under the blue tent and we'll evaluate mm -hmm. them and further examine them. And that's more on our team physician that will do that examination. After that, if it's determined that he passes that initial step, he can return back to play. Mm -hmm. If he's symptomatic or displaying functional deficits that require further examination, then he goes to the back. Once he goes to the back, if the examination you know, continues to reveal that, you know, his condition is worsening, then he's out. If they go back in and then say he passes the test and there's a, um, an unaffiliated neuroconsultant that's with us the whole time and they're, you know, watching the process and evaluating how we do things or not necessarily how we do things, but, you know, evaluating it, 
you know, with us. So it's almost like having two set of eyes on them. And then once they have their eyes on it, they also give, you know, sample approval, the doctor gives a sample approval or denial, right? So if they feel like he's not doing so hot, you know, he'll be out. But then if they feel like, all right, you know what, he's actually feeling better, then you come back in. There's also an ATC spotter, which is an athletic trainer in the booth that will also monitor certain hits that maybe slip through the cracks. So if it's something that's not as apparent, oh man, like this guy, you know, hit his head or maybe he was away from the ball and he got blindsided and we didn't see that and he got hit. They'll mic us down and say, hey, check on this person. He has to be evaluated. Ooh, and it's wow. like he has to be evaluated. He's not allowed to back in. So go in the blue tent, you know, go through that protocol. The refs also have the power to be able to stop a play and say, hey, this person needs to be evaluated. Hmm. So there's almost like three mechanisms, right? It's like just wa us watching it. There's an ATC spotter and there's also the refs. So there's almost like three mechanisms that will or could potentially initiate that protocol mm -hmm. or that evaluation process. And then, you know, it kind of goes all the way through. And that's how, you know, that's managed as well. But the protocol of return to play is very, is, you know, is very specific through the NFL and, you know, provides a great framework to be able to know, you know, are you symptomatic? No. Yes. You don't proceed. If you're not, then you proceed. The next step, you know, we do cardio. Are you symptomatic? No, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, diff there's different functional steps that are based off symptoms. There's also uh, repeat testing. So you have to repeat the symptom checklist and repeat the testing, which is a SCAT-5. Um, you have to repeat that every day while they're there. And they also have, um, they also have appointments with neuro consultants and neuro, um, this other uh, neurological consultants. Mm -hmm. And they have to meet with two different people during the week as well. So, so they're getting evaluated every day by multiple people. And then that determination is made you know, Friday, Saturday before Sunday game. Mm -hmm. So okay. I feel like, you know, there's a lot of, you know, things that go into being able to go back out onto the play. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the NFL has done a good, good job of, you know, when the player passes the protocol or has taken all the steps, you feel very confident about the player coming back to play. There's no doubt, you know, mm -hmm. it's you know, maybe there's you know, multiple injuries, but that's a case by case basis. But if you're just thinking about a singular, um, injury mm -hmm. you go through the protocol and you have everyone kind of collaborate and be able to make sure that they're asymptomatic and functional mm -hmm. you feel very good and very confident about that going back into the field um, yeah. does that work for any injuries as well not just uh, the traumatic brain injuries that they get like for so, example yeah. like so that, that i'd probably say there's less you know you know nfl protocol type stuff you know there's no no, no nfl protocol say for an acl reconstruction Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. basically so you have your own, you know, how we go about rehabbing guys. So, but regardless, there's collaboration of everyone, regardless, performance team, medical staff, everyone. So even though they're maybe handled differently because ortho versus neuro versus, you know, head, mm -hmm. head injury, the collaboration stays consistent and the communication stays consistent, regardless of where, who it is, where it is, what it is, um, that stays consistent. And that's, you know, a testament to um, our director of sports medicine, Reggie Scott, who's my boss, you know, who was in Carolina with me in 2008. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's more of a testament to him to create that culture and create that environment for that collaboration. And, you know, that doesn't just happen overnight. That isn't just something you say, oh, we're going to start collaborating. Right. It's something that's fostered through you know, meticulous, you know, hours of building relationships with people, making sure that there's constant communication between each other, making sure that you outline your process with, of, you know, of what your goals are. And I think that, you know, once you start to inject that, you know, philosophy to, you know, individuals, you know, individuals become a team. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of one special thing that Reggie has really done with us is, you know, we operate as a team, and not as mm -hmm. individuals. Right. So building that culture of collaboration is important. I, I think that's, that's universal. I think that goes, if you work in the orthopedic outpatient ortho clinic, collaboration of yourself with, with your patient, with the surgeon, with the doctor, with your coworkers, you know, I think that's important. And I think that's consistent wherever you go. 
I agree. And yep. And my last question for uh, you is that, you know, with the virus happening and stadiums are empty, we get social distancing enforced in everywhere we go. Now, how challenging is that? And you knowing that you're going to be hands on with some of your patients, how different was the practice before COVID and after COVID? You know, I, I think, again, the NFL has done a great job outlining those protocols. It's ever-changing. It's gotten, you know, a lot more strict over the past few weeks just because with all the cases rising. Okay. But, you know, for us, it's really just trying to be the best example for everyone because you're not going to achieve kind of this, like, mini bubble or this area in which you feel safe unless you get buying from everyone, and that starts with us. So even it's as simple as just me always wearing a mask and we also have our face shields now too. Um, just making sure we practice those good habits so that when players are also, you know, asking us questions and stuff like that, you know, we can kind of give them the best answer and the best feedback by, by, by first of all, being the you know, best example, but also educating ourselves as well, you know, making sure that we know, you know, what the protocols are, what's allowed, what's not allowed. You know, it is pretty black and white and uh, the NFL, you know, it has started imposing fines. So, you know, that usually, that uh, usually, you know, volumes. Uh -huh. uh, well, uh -huh. reinforce some certain things. So, but, but regardless of that, I think, you know, again, executing these things at a high level, it's not just half-assing them. You know, if this is a protocol. This is what we need to do. This is what we need to do. It's not just, oh, well, you know what? You know, I really didn't wear, feel like wearing it can new. N95 mask on the plane. I want to wear my own plane or I want to wear my own mask because it's more comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're going to have to wear because the protocol, that's what we have to do. And, you know, it doesn't really matter what your personal preference is. This is stuff we need to do to be able to play football. And, you know, that's the other thing too, is you think about the bigger picture. It's right, right. everyone has their different opinions about COVID and everything else, but you have to kind of lay those personal, you know, biases aside and look at the bigger picture and also think about your, your neighbor and the people that, you know, it may affect, you know, by me saying, I don't care about it or no, this is silly. This is stupid. But someone who does take it seriously, that has a family that has a young child that has maybe a parent or a spouse that is immunocompromised. What is that saying to them by me not doing that? Mm -hmm. um, but regardless, you know, I, th I think that's, you know, one thing I, I hope and I, I, people have been doing and been, been very good at being considerate. And I think being considerate of your teammate is just as important as, you know, you know, your assignment when you're on the field and, you know, making sure I wash my hands between patients, you know, it's just the right thing to do. And at this point, this late in the game, social distancing, wearing your masks, doing all the precautions that you need to do is just the right thing to do at this point for us. So, you know, it's not so much like, oh, you know, what your opinion is. It's just, is it right or is it wrong? Is it good or is it bad? And I think everyone will kind of, you know, focus on the right and the good at this point. All right. Thank you, John. <laughs> so John, um, yeah, so uh, now that you uh, touched on it, you do handle uh, world-class athletes, like football's a religion here in the States. So like <laughs> uh, people on game day, they're like, have their rituals. So um, people look up to these athletes and you work, want, work with them and handle them on an everyday basis. So, um, however, um, of course, you've had uh, experience in the orthopedic, uh, outside of sports, orthopedic uh, areas, uh, pediatric, neurologic, geriatric. Um, how would you, uh, how would you uh, compare working with these uh, world-class athletes compared to other populations that we uh, usually uh, see in the physical therapy? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I get that a good amount. And I say there's no difference. Mm -hmm. And the reason <laughs> I say that is because you treat every human the same. Uh, good answer. But <laughs> what I mean by that is you build a relationship with them first. And the relationship is just human to human contact, right? That's just you talking to another individual, regardless of, you know, their function, their worth, their, you know, how old they are. Mm -hmm. You just get to know them, right? And I think that's important and that should be unbiased regardless of, you know, who you're working with because that's what sets the foundation for you to get, have a good working relationship with them is having a good, um, having good rapport with them. And 
when you think about that, you forget about like, oh, he's a world class class athlete that's you know worth you know millions of dollars mm -hmm. you're, you're giving them the best care you can because that's your job mm -hmm. you're not going to give them bad care the same way you're not going to give an eight-year-old lady you know that needs a max assist out of the bed you know are you going to give her half-assed worked probably not you're going to give her the best possible care you can so again regardless of who you're working with i think if you focus on giving them the best care you know, that really doesn't matter. So I think, you know, when you talk about, you know, individual needs and specific needs, that's when it starts to, you know, obviously filter out, you know, if, if her goal is to get in and out of bed at a, a mod assist and, you know, Aaron Donald, you know, wants to get back on the field and wreak havoc and, you know, have like four sacks a game, you know, those are different ends of the spectrum. Right. And, it's up to us as physical therapists to determine our, what skills they need. Again, what's your end goal? How do I dissect that and then build it back up? Either way. But I think the constant and the consistent is, is the relationship that you build and also putting forth your best work and best effort, regardless of who it is. So I think probably those would probably be the two you know, commonalities is you know, your, your rapport and building a relationship with them. And then also to you know, always giving, putting forth your best effort and then obviously the one difference is their needs and their goals. You know, I think it goes back to PT school, right? What are your goals? Short-term, right. long-term, all that stuff. And then it's up to us to be able to, you know, break that down. So, you know, I would say, you know, for that, that's kind of like the, I think there's more similarities than our differences. Mm -hmm. nice. right. Wow. That's really good advice, not just to uh, aspiring uh, Filipino PTs, but uh, actually to everyone. <laughs> as a, as a, I agree. You know? <laughs> Awesome answer, John. Yep. Uh, so yeah. So going back to uh, uh, working with these uh, world class world class athletes, um, what's uh, what what have you found to be uh, the most uh, challenging parts of uh, just uh, working as a PT in the NFL? Uh, losing. <laughs> losing. <Ooh. laughs> the mood when the team loses. You mean? I'm sorry. When the team loses. You oh mean? yeah. The mood, the vibe. I hate all of that. <laughs> not a good place to be the locker room after a bad a bad loss is a horrible place to be mm -hmm. you still have to get the job done if someone gets hurt you're still doing your job you know you're still taking care of them you know you're still getting ready for the next game but that 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 instance that moment you know like that's the, you know heavy it wears on you huh it's shitty i would say other than that i think every like uh, you know I honestly think I'm, I'm just blessed and lucky to work where I work with the organization that I'm with and with the team that I'm with and have the coworkers I have, mm -hmm. because I mean, I love my job. There's nothing I would trade it in for um, aside, from, aside from losing and winning every game. You know, I come to work every day. I love it. I love my coworkers. I love everyone I work with. So, you know, there isn't any downside. And honestly, I, you could say the hours, but then I told you earlier that the hours don't really matter to me because, you know, I'm always having fun, you know, that flies by mm -hmm. uh, maybe the schedule you know i missed out on a lot of weddings and a lot of uh baptisms and a lot of stuff that happens from like july to hopefully february so like july to, july to january i miss out on a lot of things uh-huh you know it's kind of like you know nature of the business i've actually had some friends say like oh man like you know it's because of my wedding in the spring to make sure you make it i was like no i don't do that <laughs> no, do you have your wedding when you want don't worry about me <laughs> I see. Yeah. So yeah. Um. So actually, for uh, most of uh, our listeners and most of uh, not just Filipino PTs but PTs in general, you you do you are living the dream. You have your dream job. So, um. Uh, now we want to kind of ask how, what what the perks are, what the highs are, what uh, what's uh the best parts, the best memories of uh, working in the P uh as a PT in the NFL so far. Yeah, I mean, I would say the biggest thing for me is like it's cliche but like the teamwork man I, I really enjoyed the collaboration i really enjoyed being able to work with other professionals and other experts in their field dietitian player engagement strength conditioning coaches you know sports psychologists and being able to learn from them mm -hmm. and then having it come together i think it's really rewarding seeing all that stuff come together and seeing athletes you know really perform at a high level um, athletes that some people don't see, you know, they'll really open up to us. And I think that's a huge win, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we're going through the rehab process. 
So I think, you know, those things are super rewarding to me. Um, I mean, you can think about like, you know, the other perks, you know, going to, you know, I mean, going to the Super Bowl was huge and that was a really cool experience. You know, mm -hmm. unfortunately we lost, but the whole experience of winning the NFC championship game, which was also crazy as well. I think that was a cool experience. I, I put that up there. And then the the two weeks leading up to the Super Bowl was just a really cool experience for me. And, you know, even though we lost, it was cool and rewarding just to, you know, the journey, right? You know, we always talk about, I talk about, you know, it's not work. Don't worry about the destination. Worry about, you know, the travel or, you know, how you get there. Um, right. The one thing we have too is don't focus on the results, focus on the process because the result happened. We lost, it was crappy and it was a bad loss. But then when I look back at, you know, what we did that whole year, I'm like, man, that was super cool. Mm -hmm. That was really rewarding. And we had, you know, unfortunate shooting around the area that really affected a lot of people in this area. And we had the fires as well. And a whole bunch of people mm -hmm. lost their homes and got relocated and we were supposed to play in Mexico. And that game got canceled. We ended up playing Monday night against the Kansas City Chiefs in L.A. We gave out, I think, tens of thousands of tickets to um, firemen and police officers that kind of helped with the fires and also helped with the shooting. Mm -hmm. And that experience to me was like my Super Bowl. Like, that was an awesome experience. I, I get chills talking about it and thinking about it. Um, but for me, you know, that was a really cool experience. So, again – not so much the results of Super Bowl and all that stuff. It was the process. It was the little things that we had to deal with that we were able to, you know, get through mm -hmm. as a team and then get us to that point, I think was really cool for, you know, for us. So I, I definitely think that that process and that journey was more rewarding, you know, than, you know, the Super Bowl. I mean, Super Bowl is awesome. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> right. I don't want to go, but that process was really cool. And when you look back at it and it was with, you know, the coworkers that I truly enjoyed, you know, being with and loved, you know, that just made it even sweeter. I see. Yeah, that was an awesome season you, you had, you guys had, by the way. Yeah. So you did touch on uh, teamwork and uh, one of uh, the parts that you really love about your job is like working as, as a part of the team. Um, so more on that, like um, how... Uh, how uh, how would you describe uh, working as part of the medical team? Do you have a specific roles? Um, like you did, we did touch uh, earlier on what the overlap is between athletic trainers, strength and conditioning, and then PTs. So uh, how's the roles um, in that team that you're in? How's the collaboration? Um, so in regards to that question, you know, my boss, Reggie, he does a great job of empowering people to just, you know, do as much as they can and not just siloing people. Like this is your exact role. Obviously we have roles and responsibilities that is individualized and everyone has, you know, different things they need to execute. But in terms of care, you know, empowering an athletic trainer to take on a long-term rehab and not, not, to, not just not being a, a PT thing, mm -hmm. I think is really important. But the same goes in reverse, right? So for me to do rehabs, for me to do taking embracing and being able to be on the field to, acutely manage something, you know, that's probably more of an athletic training thing, but he empowers me to do that as well. So I think, you know, I'd say part of like my main responsibility and some of the things I try and do uh, for, on the rehab aspect, I probably focus a little bit more on that. Um, but in regards to everything day-to-day -day stuff, you know, we kind of do everything, you know, we treat, we tape and brace, we rehab, we watch the field, we, you know, take guys through, um, you know, workouts, you know, with the strength staff and then also, you know, collaborate with our doctors as well. So I think, and all of us can talk to our doctors, no matter who it is, no matter, you know, the person or the, the case, we, we have open dialogue with our, with our physicians and our doctors, which I, think, which I think is really important as well. Again, the collaboration and the communication. So I think that, you know, again, you know, creating that culture to be able to have those conversations, I think is real important. And again, not so much the PT, ATC, strength coach, it's, you know, sports medicine question, right? right? Mm -hmm. Being able to everything, which is, again, you know, one thing I really love about the position. All right. So you're Filipino great as well that um, you do what is asked of you. So, yep. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll take it back to you. Okay. That, is also the, that is also the case too. I will do whatever you need me to do. Mm-hmm. 
All right. So again, we want to thank you for, for giving us your time because we're already end, at the end of the uh, conversation. But um, what advice uh, would you give to like physical therapists who are aspiring to work in NFL or any other like elite sports? Yeah, I'll go back to what I said a few minutes ago is focus on the process and not the results. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten a lot of questions and, um, you know, messages like, you know, my goal is to be NFL PT at, you know, PT. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. Mm -hmm. How do I get there? But, you know, for me, even though that's your goal in the back of your mind, that wasn't my goal. I want like, you know, when I was, I want to work basketball. Like, you know, I grew up working basketball. I knew nothing about football. Like this isn't like I, so for them to say like, oh, what what did you do to be that? Like, did you always Mm -hmm. want to be that? Mm -hmm. And I I, I did it, but the process in which I, it took to get me here, you know, I learned to love, you know, where I'm at because I fell in love with the process, whether it was PT school, you know, I, it's, studying sucks. Yeah, I get it. But, you know, I fell in love with, you know, the grind of being able to learn as much as I can, you know, while I was there mm-hmm. when I did my sports residency, you know, learning about multiple sports and learning from different clinicians, you know, and during residencies, you have these mentors that have decades of experience and decades of knowledge that, you know, I could condense in a year. So I was trying to pick their brain and learn as much as I can from them. Mm-hmm. When I was in Buffalo in my first job in the NFL. I was just learning about football. How do I, how, what is it like to be in the NFL in pro sports as a physical therapist, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, being able to come back to the, to the Rams in LA, like I couldn't have ever thought of that, mm-hmm. you know, that, that I could, that wasn't the result I could ever have imagined, but it's what happened. It was the result of the different parts of the process. Right. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I, Cause it's, there wasn't even a team in, in LA in the Rams. And yes, mm-hmm. there is a little bit of luck, you know, they ended up moving to LA and, you know, I fell in love with LA and mm-hmm. ended up coming back, but I wasn't so much focused on, on that, mm-hmm. even though it was in the back of my mind, mm-hmm. kind of being where your feet are. It's mm-hmm. focusing on the process, focusing on what the task at hand is and putting forth your best effort, mm-hmm. um, not just half-assing it, you right. know, not just, you know, I'm just going to do this just to check the box and then, you know, you know, on to the next one. Mm-hmm. Just give your best effort because one thing I will say this with this as well, you know, some of our interns, I always tell them, you know, I won't always acknowledge certain things that you do, but I will notice them. So even though I'm not going to give you a pat on the back, oh, good job, like you did this, you did that, doesn't mean I don't notice it. And for people who put their head down and get the work done and don't expect all these accolades and don't expect like, oh, I'm going to do this so someone notices, um, I notice that. I notice when people do it for for acknowledgement, and I would notice when people who do it because they genuinely want to do it Mm -hmm. and they need to get it done and they put forth their best effort. So I feel like as long as you do that in whatever you do, in whatever clinical rotation that you're in, in whatever class that you're taking, you know, I think that provides the steps and checks the boxes throughout the process that will get you to the result that you want. You know what I'm saying? So you ain't going to get there unless you do the stuff that's, you know, you need to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just happen. You know, you have to put work, you know, throughout the process to get there. So focus on that. I always say like, yeah, I know it's kind of like you, you trust the process and all that stuff, but it really is true. Like you just have to trust your process and the results will come, but that only happens when you put forth the work at the time where your feet are and whatever that you do. Right. Good answer. Good advice. All right. So this is my last bite. Uh, I usually like ask everyone, my guest about this. So, um, so uh, the, the, the show is called PT Meal. It's a complete meal of uh, uh, inspiration and, and story. So, so my last question is, what are the, the three ingredients that make up John Hernandez? It can be like a philosophy, a trade, a motto. So what makes up you? Man, I, think I, I use all my cliche uh, saying. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just go with what I've been saying, man. Mm-hmm. Prospect yeah. results. You got you got to focus on that because mm-hmm. if you don't put in the work, you know, during that process, you're never going to get your result, and it's not mm-hmm. going to be, you know, what you expect it to be, mm-hmm. because it's not probably what you want it to be. Mm-hmm. And I don't want people to get caught up in like saying like, oh, just because you want something, like don't like, just focus on that. Like, 
you know, obviously in the back of my mind, like, yeah, I would love to be in pro sports. Mm-hmm. That's what's in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. But at the forefront, it should always be about the process in which you take to get there and the work you have to put in. Like that is something you cannot substitute. That's something you cannot dip or dodge. That's just something you have to do. And, you know, through that, that sets you up to have options, to have certain things, to be able to open certain doors, mm-hmm. you know, later on down the road. But I think the sooner people can think that or kind of shift their mindset to focus on that, I think you'll have more success than you think uh, when you just focus on the little things and focus on the task at hand. Mm-hmm. So focusing on your goal. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. It, you know, the goal is always there, mm-hmm. but you know, like PT world, right? You have a long-term girl, long-term goal. Short term. Mm-hmm. You ain't going to get to the long-term goal unless you get to your short-term goal. Same thing with in rehab, right? If you want someone to, you know, do a squat or do some sort of activity mm-hmm. and they can't even do, you know, knee extension, they don't have the quad, you know, strength to do it, then now you'd expect to have a good squat, right? right. You have mm-hmm. certain things you have to be able to do before you get to that. Mm-hmm. And you can skip out on those things because that, sh- that stuff will pop up, you know, eventually later on. Mm-hmm. So again, giving the steps and making sure that you put forth your best effort, you know, for all the steps that lead up to it. Gotcha. All right. Again, thank you very much, John, for, for spending time with us and sharing your experiences with us uh, as a, an NFL physical therapist. I sure did learn a lot. I, I, I never knew how much effort and, and what do you call this uh, skill and it has going to uh, being a physical therapist in NFL. I imagine it's going to be hard work because you're handling like, pro athlete but never like this so yeah thank you for giving us that that picture of what you do as a as a physical therapist there really appreciate it no i appreciate it and i also said you know said this at the beginning and i want to make sure this is and you'll cut on air uh, johan i think you're doing a great thing i think this is an awesome podcast and i think to be to have this platform and to kind of give you know filipinos but also filipino physical therapists which is kind of like a small kind of sector you know a little bit of a voice and a little bit of representation i think is awesome so you know whatever i can do to help and uh, keep it up man you guys are doing a great job all right thanks thanks man great talking to you john thank you i love it thank you john